from Mola to Man-Eater. This story is the sequel to two episodes I have recorded in the earlier books of adventures. The first of these began when a tiger began to behave very strangely by mauling the graziers of the hamlet of Rajnagara at the foot of the Dimbum escarpment in North Coimbatore district in what is now known as Madras state. The unique feature was that this tiger never bit any of its human victims nor was there any authentic proof that it had killed or eaten anybody. It merely rushed at its victim and, when close enough raised itself on its hind legs and severely mauled him with the claws of its forefeet in the region of the head, chest, back and arms. I attempted to bag this elusive animal, but failed completely. Then the scene changed to a very much wider area of operations, varying from 60 to 100 miles north and northeast of Rajnagara. A tiger killed and carried off a boy at another little hamlet in the jungle, called Pegapalium. That boy was the first of several victims, some of whose remains were recovered. The bodies bore unmistakable evidence of having been severely mauled by the claws of the tiger which had attacked them, while teeth marks, other than where the flesh had been eaten, were conspicuously absent. In one case, two men who had climbed up a tree saw their companion actually being mauled by this tiger, which attacked him on two separate occasions, clawing him across the face the first time, and killing him with a blow of its paw the second time, before it carried him off. The human remains that had been found indicated that there was apparently nothing wrong with the animal's teeth or jaws, as had at first been conjectured. For he had eaten a good meal from each, which would hardly have been possible with impaired teeth or a broken or otherwise maimed jaw. His constant mode of assault, however, which was by clawing and striking with his forepaws and not by biting, appeared to indicate beyond doubt that this animal was none other than the earlier, mauler of Rajnagara, that had strayed northwards into an area of jungle far larger than his original habitat. My son Donald made two attempts to bag this beast, the first at Pegapalium itself, and the second near the road between Lokanhali and Baylor, in the very area where I had encountered the Ramapuram tiger some years before point one, but he had met with bad luck, for on both occasions this tiger had not returned to the remains of the human victims he had killed and over which Donald had, with the utmost difficulty, persuaded the bereaved relatives to allow him to sit. Naturally, both Donald and I scanned the newspapers keenly for further reports of man-killing, besides receiving such reports as the forest department sent us from time to time. From these sources scanty news trickled through at long intervals. Human beings began to fall victim to a tiger in scattered areas and in the most remote northeastern corners of the Kaligal Taluk in North Coimbatore district, just south of the Calvary River, which separates it from Mysore state on the northwest and the Salem district, which is a part of Madras state, on the north and east. Two definite and authentic items of news eventually arrived. The first was a report that, while grazing her cattle, an old woman had been carried off by a tiger which never so much as touched any of the browsing herd. Her remains were never found. This happened at a cattle patty named Gulia. The second report was that a man grazing cattle had been attacked and mauled, but not killed, at another patty named Alambadi just across the Calvary River from Salem district. In this case it was reported that the herdsman, who was standing in the midst of his cattle while the animals were feeding in the jungle looked up in time to see a tiger spring from an adjacent bush and regardless of the beasts all around, come straight at him. He yelled at the tiger, and as it came within reach he pluckily swung at it with the wooden staff he was holding. It appears that the tiger then reared up on its hind legs and severely clawed his chest and arms, knocking him down. But among the man's cattle were five buffaloes, and these animals happened to be grazing nearby. As buffaloes often do, the five of them joined together and charged the tiger, which turned tail and fled. Although severely injured, the man was able to stagger back to the patty where there were several other herdsmen to succor him. A patty is a patch of jungle which has been led by the government to a number of herdsmen for crawling cattle at night that have been licensed to graze in the reserved forest. These animals are permitted to feed during the day in any direction. The grazing period lasts for about six months out of twelve, after the monsoons and during the hot dry weather, when there is no fodder to be found near the villages. 
The license costs 4 annas per animal for the 6 months, which works out to about 1 shilling for 3 head of cattle for 6 months. This breaks down to 2 thirds of a penny per animal per month for the right to feed all day within an area approximately 28 square miles. However, to get back to our story, because the scenes of these two incidents, and Alambadi in particular, were close to the Calvary River, with Salem District on the other side, with reasonably good roads and communications, the news spread quicker and in greater detail, so that we heard about it in Bangalore within a month of the incidents in question. This is not a long time for such conditions and such remote areas. It was therefore reasonably certain that this tiger was not entirely devoted to man-eating. He was following the general practice of man-eating panthers, attacking human beings only when an exceptionally easy opportunity turned up or perhaps when the mood seized him. At other times he was obviously living on wild game, as there were no more than the usual number of cattle being killed in the area by tigers and panthers. Time passed and we were beginning to forget about this tiger when reports came in quick succession that two persons had been killed and eaten at a small hamlet with the rather curious name of Bejahai. It was reputed that the body of the first victim was never recovered, but the second was found after it had been half devoured. This man had been badly mauled and clawed about the face and chest. Donald agreed with me that at last we had something concrete and authentic to work upon. The elusive tiger of Pegapalium, which we suspected to be no other than the Mauler of Rajnagara, appeared to be again at work. According to the map, the hamlet of Bejahai was situated almost 3,000 feet above sea level in a valley to the east of the highest mountain peak in Koligal Taluk, named Ponahai Beta or Ponachi Malai, itself nearly 5,000 feet up. Donald had long determined to shoot this tiger and solve the riddle of its strange habit of mauling its victims before killing them. So he decided to set out on a month's safari, as he called it, to accomplish his objective. What follows is Donald's story, as he told it to me. After receiving reports of the two human kills that had taken place at Bejahai, I decided at all costs to get the tiger that had been responsible especially as I was sure it was the same beast I had tried unsuccessfully to shoot almost a year before at Pegapalium. There were two curious things about this tiger. The first was that he was reported to claw the people he attacked rather than bite them. The second was that he never returned to a human kill. I had already sat up for him over human bodies without success. So I got things ready in a hurry and collected as much cash I could, nearly 300 rupees, to pay for my baits and general expenses while I was out on safari. Although this was a good deal of money, it was well worth spending if I could shoot this tricky animal that had proved such a menace for so long. So at 5 o'clock one morning I set out in my car, which although old, had proved itself over and over again as very good for jungle work. I stopped for a couple of hours at Pentagram to pick up Dad's old shikari, a fellow named Ranga, whom I regarded more as an old friend than a servant. I then made a diversion down a jungle road to a place called Mato, seven miles away in a valley on the banks of the China River, where I persuaded Baira, another old Shikari friend, to accompany me too. Baira is a Pujari, an Aborigine who was born and bred in the jungle. Dad and I have known him for many years. Although he is pretty old, I still think he is even better than Ranga when it comes to jungle knowledge and work. He is certainly a better tracker. We motored back to Pentagram and then turned due west, to cover another 10 miles to a hamlet named Hoganichel, on the banks of the Calvary River. There are some waterfalls here which have become famous for religious reasons, at least so far as the Hindu faith is concerned. Years ago another very good shikari lived here, who had at one time got into trouble with the government through shooting an elephant on one of his poaching trips. He also knew me from an early age, but he was now dead. A mile from Hoganichel is a village named Utaimalai, where Dad has a one-roomed brick hut which he used in the old days as a camping place when game was plentiful in the area and he came regularly on hunting trips. Conditions have changed since then, however, and there is not much to shoot in the locality. I left my car in front of his hut and in charge of the local forest guard. 
Then I distributed all the kit I had brought between Ranga, Baira and myself and we set out to cover the rest of the journey to Bejaai, about nine and a half miles, on foot. First we walked three miles down the road that led northwestwards from Utaimalai, along the banks of the Kavari River, towards a place named Baligandlu. At the third mile there is a ferry across the river, and we had to use this to reach the Alambadi cattle patty on the further bank. Incidentally, this ferry is not a regular wooden boat, but a circular, basket work affair, perhaps eight feet in diameter, covered with tough buffalo hide and hardly drawing six inches of water. These leather-cum basketwork jobs are known locally as coracles. They are controlled by one man with a short wooden paddle. He is highly skilled in negotiating the strong river currents and in avoiding the sharp edges of rocks that often lie just below the surface. When we set foot on across the river, near Alambadi, we were in Kaligul Taluk, which is a part of North Coimbatore district and has quite a separate forest department administration. Alambadi was one of the places at which this tiger had seriously mauled a man some months earlier. I tried to get more information about the animal from the herdsmen living in the patty, but I could gather very little. Two facts were prominent, however. The first, that everyone was terribly scared and walked about in fear of their lives. The second, gained from those who had seen the man who had been mauled, was that he had been severely clawed about his shoulders, chest and back, but had not been bitten anywhere. The poor fellow had since succumbed to his wounds as a result of blood poisoning. The place for which I was bound was the hamlet named Bejahahai, on the eastern slopes of a mountain chain about 10 miles in length, running almost north and south, which has its highest peak at a point named Ponachi Malai, about 4 miles from the northern end. A stream called Gulyathahala rises somewhere south of this chain and flows in a northeasterly direction, joining the Calvary River a little north of Alambadi. There is a footpath from Alambadi to Bejahahai, which more or less follows the tributary I have just mentioned for about five miles, and then turns westwards for the remaining mile and a half to Bejahai. The three of us set out along this footpath. It was close on three in the afternoon. The sun was really fierce, and walking along the narrow and stony track was arduous. We crossed the tributary about half a dozen times. It became increasingly rocky and boulder-strewn as the land rose perceptibly towards the mountain chain ahead. Our trek was not altogether uneventful. We had practically completed the first five miles and were at the last river crossing before the pathway left the stream to turn westwards to Bejahahai, when we came upon a herd of elephants resting from the heat beneath the shade of the muddy and tamarind trees that grew along both banks of the tributary. They were not feeding at the time and so we did not hear them, and as the breeze was blowing down from the hills, past them and towards us, they did not scent us. I was wearing rubber-soled boots, while Ranga and Baira were barefooted. Hence they did not hear us coming, with the result that we almost walked into their midst. Pandemonium broke loose as the elephants scented and spotted us simultaneously. As if to show how cowardly these huge beasts really are, even when in large numbers, there might have been about 30 in all, the herd rushed away headlong, the shrieks of the frightened females being exceeded by the terrified trumpeting of the tuskers. The pig-like squeaking of the calves, bundling as fast as they could at their mother's heels added to the confusion. What was most amusing was that the big tuskers, whom one might expect to put up a rearguard action to protect the cows and babies, actually jostled them aside and vied with one another in showing a clean pair of heels. In a few moments, where there had been many elephants and much noise, there was nothing but a deep silence. We reached our destination without further event at about 5 in the evening. Although it was a comparatively long time till sunset, the whole area was already in shade, for the sun had sunk behind the frowning ridge of the mountain chain. The actual peak of Ponachi Malai towered to the northwest, a little over a mile away. Bejahahai was like all jungle hamlets, and consisted of about a dozen huts clustered together. Most of them had walls of thorn and roofs of dried jungle grass, the thorns and the grass being kept together with spliced bamboos tied with lengites of dried jungle vines. One or two of them, which were clearly better class buildings, had three foot walls of dried mud, 
plastered with cow dung, but with the same roofing of jungle grass. The cattle pens which adorned the rear of each hut had low walls of woven bamboo, topped by a stockade of thorns. The latter were necessary to keep out marauding panthers and tigers. Our advent caused quite a stir. Two or three dozen men, wearing nothing but wisps of rag around their loins, bare-breasted women with tatted and torn saris, and pot-bellied children, affected by enlarged spleens owing to the ever-present malarial mosquitoes, timidly stepped out of their huts or stood in the doorways to watch us suspiciously and rather fearfully. One or two of the men salaamed nervously. We came to a stop in the center of this group of hovels. Obviously, if I expected him to answer questions, the first thing to do was to set the inhabitants at ease. With that in view I judged that Byra would be the best person to speak. For one thing he was an aborigine himself, and these scared folk would understand him. I knew from experience that Raya was rather haughty towards people whom he considered his social inferiors, and would call them by such disparaging names as jungle monkeys and stupid apes. If I spoke to them myself they would perhaps become even more nervous. Certainly they would not believe me. I told Byra to introduce us. Never have I been so flattered as by his words. Byra said that I was a great hunter who had shot hundreds of tigers, elephants, panthers and similar insignificant creatures, and that hearing of the plight of the inhabitants of Bejar, I had come many miles to deliver them. He said that an essential contribution from them would be all the information and help I could get. His speech was a bit long-winded, but I must say it accomplished its purpose. Smiles crept over some of the faces surrounding me. But anyway, the tension clearly eased. I can speak Tamil and Hindustani, and understand some canaries. Most of my hearers were Tamil, although I could make out a few shalagas who, like Bara, are aborigines and have inhabited the Korimbatore forests from time immemorial. So at this stage one took an active part in the proceedings by addressing the gathering in Tamil. As simply as I could, I told the people that my purpose was to rid them of the terrible menace that had come into their lives. I also told them I was confident of success. There was but one condition, that I should receive their unstinted and active cooperation. I said that I expected every able-bodied man in the village to assist me to the utmost. My simple speech appeared to have the desired effect. Villages in India do not applaud by clapping their hands as do the people of the West. But they do something as good, if not infinitely better. They smile, even laugh in approval. The inhabitants of Bejahai smiled widely that evening. Having won their goodwill, I began questioning him about the tiger. I asked if any of them had seen him, if there was anything distinctive about his methods or appearance, if he had any particular or peculiar habits or any favorite locality in which he was likely to be found. Several of the simple folk replied that they had seen the man-eater, but from their generally contradictory answers it was soon evident that either there were many different looking tigers about the place, or that the people were saying they had seen this beast just to please me. As one might expect, the majority proclaimed that he was an animal of colossal dimensions, with a head about two feet in diameter and a body at least twelve feet long. One or two of the women who said they had glimpsed the marauder prowling near the outskirts of the hamlet were emphatic that this was a tigress and not a tiger. But in one respect they were all in close agreement, that it would be quite useless for me to attempt to shoot the man-eater. He, or she, was protected, they were confident, by a forest goddess that sat astride the neck and accompanied the animal on its hunting forays. Indeed, they were quite sure that the goddess led the man-eater directly to each unsuspecting victim. While this harangue went on, I noticed that one man, who squatted on the ground slightly apart and never so much as opened his mouth, wore a rather cynical smile while the rest tried to outdo one another in their wild statements. He was a middle-aged fellow, clearly a sholiger, and wore only the briefest of loin cloths. Thinking he might not understand the Tamil I spoke, I asked Ira to question him. But the man interrupted by saying, I can understand you, Darai, and I shall speak as soon as these liars around us have stopped talking. Those words had a silencing effect and the throng ceased jabbering at once. 
The Shaliga then began to speak and his words were as unusual as they were dramatic. For one thing, Darai, he said, the man-eater is male and not female. I know this for certain, for just three days ago, when I had climbed up a tree to catch an udumbu that was sheltering in it, he came out of the jungle and calmly squatted down at the foot of the tree, waiting for me to descend. I shouted at him and hurled twigs, but he only growled and glared up at me menacingly. I thought he would never go away, but towards midday, when the sun reached its zenith and the waves of heat danced above the ground, he became thirsty and suddenly walked off into the jungle. I thought it was a trick and that he would be hiding in the undergrowth, waiting for me to descend. So I remained in the tree for another two hours. Just as I was wondering what I should do, there was a great hubbub and a pack of about a dozen wild dogs chased a sambar stag into the clearing beneath my tree and tore him to bits in a few moments. Then they started feeding on the carcass. This I knew was my only chance. No tiger, not even a man-eater, will dare to show itself in the face of a pack of wild dogs. If I came down from the tree and made my escape the dogs would not harm me, while the chances were that the tiger had fled long ago. So I did that, Darai. The dogs stopped feeding, stood up, and looked at me inquiringly. But not one of them ran away. It was as if instinct told them I was unarmed and helpless and that they could kill me if they wanted. And while they were still looking at me I stole off and managed to return to the hamlet without harm. Although I do admit I was terribly afraid, once I got away from the presence of the wild dogs which had actually been the means of saving my life, as I was sure the man-eater would have returned to the vicinity after slaking his thirst in one of the few remaining pools that are fast drying up in the stream. Well, Darai, I saw the animal clearly. It is not such a big tiger as these people try to make out, but only of average size. But it has quite a long tail. I noticed that particularly, as it kept twitching it from side to side while glaring up at me. And that glance, Darai. I have never seen such diabolical hatred in the eyes of any living creature as I saw in the eyes of that tiger. How is it that you did not return and tell the other villagers what you had seen? I asked suspiciously. The Shaliga remained silent for a while. Then he said, there is a reward for the death of this animal. I intended borrowing my uncle's muzzle-loading gun and trying to shoot it. My uncle is due back in this village the day after tomorrow. I wanted the reward, for I am a poor man. Nor would I have told you about the incident, but my stomach was turned at hearing the silly tales these villagers have been telling you. A murmur of anger and protest rippled through the throng, but the Shaliga continued. This tiger has no magic nor goddess to protect it, Darai. But it does have brains, much more brains than most of the people standing here. However, if the Darai is really in earnest and means to shoot it, I will help him. For I have brains, too, more brains than the tiger or these folk around us. And that was how I made the acquaintance of Lotta the Shaliga, outspoken and unusually arrogant and self-opinionated for a simple aborigine. But as I was to find out very soon, he knew his jungle and its inhabitants intimately, and he was a tremendously brave man too. I told him I would welcome all the assistance he could give me, whereupon, in token of agreement, he came and stood at the side of the two henchmen I had brought along with me. As there was little more information to be gained from the inhabitants of the hamlet, I led my three followers into the jungle for about a furlong, where we squatted on the ground to work out a plan of action. By the time all this talk was at an end another 40 minutes had elapsed. It was exactly 5.40 pm it was too late to tie out live baits, an operation which includes the complex but very essential task of selecting the most likely places in which to tether them, and the erecting of macans in advance, if possible, at those same places, so as not to cause a disturbance later on, should a kill have been made. Lotta told us that the tiger's pug marks were frequently to be seen in the morning, leading across the dry sands of the Gulyathahala stream, and that these tracks were invariably found just south of a hillock about 500 feet high that rose sharply from the left-hand or northwestern bank of the stream, a little over a mile away, coming from the same direction as we had that very evening. In fact, the pathway we had followed to Bejahahai, 
after leaving the stream, had passed this same hillock on its northern side. He told us there was a small cave near the top of the hillock in which he believed the man-eater lay up during the day. Although the whole hillock was clearly visible from the bed of the stream 500 feet below to the southeast, Lotta said the cave itself was hidden from view by a large intervening boulder. According to him, the lower two-thirds of the hillock were covered with jungle, but the higher slopes were comparatively bare, consisting of tumbled boulders piled on top of each other. Therefore, anyone approaching the cave would be at a disadvantage. Not only would he be visible to the tiger from above, but however silently a man might climb he was bound to make some sort of noise in negotiating the rough terrain and in jumping from boulder to boulder, or in trying to pass between them. We asked Lotta what made him think the tiger used the cave on the hillock as a shelter. He answered that, apart from the frequency of the tracks that crossed the riverbed and seemed to come from the hill and lead back to it, he had several times heard the Langua monkey's cries of alarm on the hill, generally too. Also, about four nights ago, a tiger had called from somewhere on the hillside. Barra pointed out that none of these happenings in themselves conclusively proved that the man-eater lived on the hill, but that all the facts put together, plus the presence of the concealed cave Lotta had mentioned, suggested it might be so. The only way of settling the question was to climb the hill and investigate the cave, if possible. So we determined that early next morning we would procure two live baits and tie one of them on the stream to the southeast of the hillock, where the tracks appeared so often, and the other on the footpath along which we had just come, and which, as I have already told you, passed the hill on the northern side. In addition, just after midday, when the sun was at its hottest, I determined to climb the hill and try to find the cave. In doing so it was possible that I might stumble across additional evidence that the tiger lived there. There was also a slim chance that I might catch a glimpse of it, perhaps even be able to get in a shot. Daylight was fading fast by the time all this was discussed and settled, and so we withdrew to Bejahai to camp for the night. The problem of accommodation arose. I had brought no tent with me because of the extra weight to be carried on our long march. Besides, it was the last week of March, when not only is the weather very dry but growing uncomfortably hot. Dad and I generally camp under trees at all times except monsoons. Lotta offered us the use of his hut. It would have been rude to refuse, but as I stood at the tiny, low entrance and looked into the small, dark and rather smelly interior without ventilation of any kind, I politely but firmly said that sleep would not come to me in such a warm and enclosed place, and that I would prefer to sleep outside. Now anyone who has tried to sleep in close proximity to any hamlet in southern India will at once agree with me that it is well nigh impossible. Not only is the ground covered with refuse and filth of every description, but it is freely used as a latrine by the inhabitants after darkness has fallen. So to avoid the refuse we walked to an open spot about 150 yards away and decided to sleep there for the night. Lotta said he would stay with us, and I lay on the ground while my three followers gathered wood and soon had a fire burning merrily. The first item on the program was to brew some tea, and while the water was boiling I ate a little of the cold salt beef and chapatis I had brought from home. Then, as I sipped the hot tea, I listened to the tales my three friends had to tell me. And indeed I was happy. The starry sky above, as it began to pale with the glow from the rising moon, the flashes of fireflies against the somber background of jungle trees, the towering and serrated outline of the Ponohai Better mountain chain to the west, the homely flickering light of our campfire with its slumber inviting warmth, and the wisps of smoke that curled and eddied and finally disappeared in the darkness, all contributed towards that happiness. Ranga and Baira had been taught to read the time from a watch, so at 8 o'clock I took off my wristwatch and handed it to Ranga, instructing him to remain awake and alert, and to feed the fire till 10.30. Then he was to awaken Baira whose guard duty would extend till 1. Then came my own turn, till 3.30. Finally, I would hand over the responsibility to Lotta, who did not know how to read the time, till the dawn came at 6. I fell asleep immediately and awoke only when Baira gently shook me by the shoulder at 1 o'clock. 
I saw that the other two men were fast asleep and Byra soon joined them. The fire had died down to a few embers and there was not much wood left to keep it alive. Finally, despite the season, it became decidedly chilly. My watch passed uneventfully. An elephant trumpeted in the distance, and a sambar stag called three or four times closer by. But the calls were not of sufficient duration to indicate the passing of a carnivore. Perhaps something smaller had frightened him, for the stag soon got over his fear and fell quiet. I began to feel sleepy again and was glad when my watch showed 3.30. I awoke Lotta, whispered to him to husband the few remaining sticks so as to keep the embers alight till dawn, and fell asleep once more. It was past 6.30 when I awoke to find my three assistants busy with a large fire they had built, on top of which I was glad to see the kettle boiling for tea. Then we set to work in real earnest. By dint of much bargaining, I managed to hire two brown bulls for ten rupees apiece. The man who hired them made it plain that he could not sell the animals outright, since he was not their owner. The true owner lived in a faraway village and had entrusted him with some 35 head of cattle for grazing over a period of six months. His salary for this was three rupees a month, plus as much milk as he might want to drink. No wonder he was tempted to hire them to me for a few nights for 20 rupees, which represented almost seven months' pay but he made it clear that if either of the animals was killed I would have to pay a hundred rupees in compensation. In addition, nobody should be told he had lent the animals for bait. He would tell the owner that the bull had been killed by a tiger while grazing. No doubt the owner would fine him by stopping two or three months pay, but as he had received a hundred rupees from me, he would make a profit of at least ninety rupees. Such is the simple logic of an otherwise honest jungle man. We retraced our steps along the path by which we had reached Bejahai the previous evening, and after covering a little over a mile found ourselves just to the north of the hill Iglota had described. Just as he had said, more than half of the lower portion was jungle clad, but beyond that the hill was bare of vegetation except for a few thorny bushes between the piles of boulders. A tamarind tree beside the track provided an ideal site for the first Macan to be tied some 15 feet above the ground, which is about the ideal height. We tethered one of the bulls by a foreleg to a stake driven into the ground in the middle of the path, then my companions set to work on making a macan. As all three of them were well skilled in jungle craft, I did not have to tell them what to do. Indeed, the completed structure, which took about 75 minutes to erect, was a work of art and so well camouflaged that it was barely visible even from a distance of 30 feet. From the tamarind tree we followed Lotta along a short cut through the jungle and reached the stream, Galyathahala, within half a mile. Turning upstream for another quarter mile, we found ourselves due southeast of the hillock and at the place which Lotta had described the evening before. His story needed no corroboration, for within a few minutes Raya found a fresh set of tiger pug marks leading across the sands of the tributary. Clearly the tiger that had made him the night before had descended from the hillock. A few yards away a half-grown plum fig tree provided another suitable place for the second macan to be tied. An hour and a half later this had been done, and we tethered the second bull to a stake driven into the bank of the stream just below the tree. It was now past noon and the next step in our campaign was for me to climb the hillock and try to locate the cave. As far as the two live baits were concerned, there was nothing more to be done except to hope that the tiger would kill and eat one or other of them during the coming night, or the night after that. Quite a sharp argument arose among my three retainers as to which one of them should accompany me, each of the three insisting that it was his particular duty. Ranga was very emphatic claiming he had carried me when I was two months old and so had known me longest. Byra was equally insistent, saying that when it came to smelling a tiger at close quarters, he was the most competent, and that therefore he would be of the most use to me. Lotta, although only recruited the day before, claimed that clearly he was the most eligible as he alone knew the position of the cave. Obviously the man to take with me was Lotta, for his claim was the most justifiable. But here a tricky situation arose. 
The complexities of the Eastern mind are somewhat difficult to fathom at times, and I well knew that. If I chose the new man to come with me, I would deeply wound the feelings, pride and affections of my two old henchmen. And to select either one of them in preference to the other, would cause even deeper hurt to the one left behind. So I made up my mind quickly. There was nothing for it but to go alone. I announced my decision as nonchalantly as possible and asked Lotta to indicate, from where we stood, the approximate position of the hidden cave. A renewed outburst was the result, all three proclaiming that such an undertaking was extremely dangerous. In fact, realizing my embarrassing position in having to choose between them, all three volunteered to step down to allow me to choose between the other two. But this did not make matters any easier. I still had to pick on one of the three to the detriment of the remaining two. Besides, having said I intended to climb the hill alone, to change my mind now would show that I was afraid. So I said very firmly that I had made my decision, I would go alone. Rather sheepishly Lotta pointed out a boulder standing a few yards from the summit of the hillock, and told me that the entrance to the cave lay right behind it. He suggested that, rather than approach the cave from directly below, I would do well to climb the hill at an angle till I reached the top, and then creep along the summit till I could overlook the cave, which I ought to have no difficulty in finding if I kept the boulder as a marker. With these instructions in mind I said no more, but crossed the stream to the opposite bank and began the ascent. The jungle that clothed the lower two-thirds of the hill effectively shielded my approach if the tiger happened to be lying near the entrance to the cave. By the same token, it hid the tiger in case he happened to be lying in the undergrowth, waiting for me to come near enough to spring upon me. I went forward very warily, intently scanning every thicket and bush ahead. Of necessity my progress in this fashion was rather slow so that it was some time before I saw that the undergrowth was becoming perceptibly thinner as I approached the higher part of the hill where the boulders predominated. But at last I reached it, only to find that I was now considerably worse off than when negotiating the jungle-clad area. I was clearly visible to any watcher from above. The tiger could creep down upon me, or he could wait for me to pass and then attack from the rear. But having committed myself to the task, there was nothing for it but to go on. Some of the boulders were quite large, being ten feet high or more. Others were small, about three feet high. In many cases it was difficult to pass between or around the smaller ones as they were jumbled together. Often I had to climb onto one and jump from it to the next. That made me very conspicuous from above. Besides, I was bound to make some noise in my movements, in spite of my rubber-soled boots and the infinite caution I exercised. At this stage one regretted my foolhardiness and began to wish that I had brought one of my companions with me. However, my luck held out and at last I stood on top of the hillock, almost at its right end. I had now to creep along the summit towards the other end till I came in sight of the boulder that hid the entrance to the cave. This I did, standing on tiptoe from time to time to see if I could see the boulder. But a fresh difficulty arose. From my position I could only see the top of each boulder and not its base, which was hidden from my view by the curvature of the hillside. And there were so many boulders that I had no means of identifying the one that Lotta had indicated. In this dilemma I still advanced, when quite unexpectedly the problem was solved for me. Suddenly a large grey shape shot out from behind a rock just in front of me and bounded away. Startled out of my wits and thinking it was the tiger, I had raised my point .470 to my shoulder. Then I saw that it was a solitary langur monkey. He leapt from rock to rock towards the other end of the hill and in a few moments had disappeared from view. The langur's presence seemed very reassuring. Had a tiger been in the vicinity, I knew quite well that the monkey would not have been there. More rapidly, and with less caution, I advanced towards the place where the langur had vanished. Then a strange thing happened. The langur gave a cry of alarm. The next instant he reappeared and came bounding back. In a series of prodigious leaps from rock to rock, he dashed past and was lost to sight behind me. Now why had the langur called in alarm? 
Why had he dashed back so wildly, almost on top of me? More cautiously I approached the spot where the monkey had reappeared. As I drew nearer to the end of the hill and could look over the edge, I caught sight of the upper half of a boulder. It came more into view as I advanced, till soon I could see it wholly, and then I knew it was the boulder that Lotta had indicated from the stream. I was standing at that moment above the cave itself. The realization came to me in a flash. The Langua had cried out and bounded back because he had probably seen the tiger lying at the entrance of the cave, or had come to realize the proximity of his age-old foe. The question that now arose was whether the tiger was outside or inside the cave, and the only way to find an answer was to go still closer. So I crept forward, inch by inch, till I came to the edge of the hill and the land fell away sharply before my feet. Dropping to my hands and knees and craning forwards, I was at last able to see the entrance to the cave, a narrow opening in the rock, which I judged to be about five feet high and perhaps a yard wide. No tiger was to be seen. I pondered what I should do next. I was tempted to call out or to throw down a pebble, in order to make the tiger charge out and so show himself. But I curbed myself in time. The tiger might not be at home. Moreover, stone throwing would needlessly frighten him. He might come out from a second cave connected with the first, of which Lotta knew nothing, and then just run away to some other part of the forest, where the job of coming to grips with him would have to be started all over again. All said and done the wisest course seemed to be not to give myself away or to frighten him, but to withdraw quietly and let events, in the form of his taking one or other of the two baits, take their own course. So, as silently as I had come, and glancing back every now and again against a surprise attack from the rear, I retraced my footsteps to the point where I had first reached the summit of the hillock, and continued down the further side till, eventually, I stood among my followers on the bed of the stream. We remained in camp that evening so as not to disturb the jungle unnecessarily and made a point of going to sleep early, although we continued to keep watch, one at a time, just as we had done the previous night. This time we took the precaution of gathering in advance a large pile of brushwood, among which were some quite big logs, so that the question of having to husband our stock should not be repeated. Duong found us on the way to examine our first bait, the bull we had tied on the pathway leading to the hamlet. He was well and unharmed, nor were any pug marks to be seen along the track. We followed the same shortcut to the stream and our second bait. But that animal was also alive, but with this difference, casting around, we found that the tiger had seen him. He had come as close as 15 yards, squatted on the stream and closely scrutinized the animal, no doubt wondering whether he should kill it or not. And then, for some unaccountable reason, he had just walked away. His pug marks on the soft river sand told us the story as clearly as if we had been watching him. With nothing to do, we returned to the hamlet to find that Lotta's uncle had turned up on schedule, bringing his matchlock with him. The presence of the gun, not of the uncle, urged Lotta into action. He put before me an idea which had his definite recommendation. Rather than spend a third night in camp, doing nothing, he strongly advocated I should beg, borrow or steal two more cattle for bait and tie them at the two remaining sides of the hill which were roughly to its east and west, and that I should sit over one of them, while he did the same with his uncle's matchlock over the fourth bait. He reasoned that, as the tiger had closely approached but not taken one of the first two baits, having clearly become suspicious, it was very likely he might do the same with baits numbers 3 and 4 if he came upon him after descending from the cave on the hillock. So Lotta suggested that I should sit over the live bait to the west, while he sat over the bait to the east. Then either of us might find a chance of shooting the tiger while he was examining the bait. Of course, if the tiger happened to kill either of these two new baits it would be all the better for us in ensuring an easy shot. By nature I am a restless person and the idea of remaining inactive day and night while waiting in the hope that the tiger would take one of the first two baits did not appeal to me at all. Several times I had toyed with the idea of trying to flush him out of his cave, but Bara and Ranga had cautioned me against the plan in case we succeeded only in frightening the tiger away. 
Under these circumstances I welcomed any plan that savoured of action and immediately fell in with Lotta's idea. Entrusting him with the task of procuring two more bulls, and that quickly, I began to prepare a hasty lunch out of some of the tinned provisions I had brought with me. Lotta succeeded more quickly than I expected, and by noon turned up with a half-grown black bull and a buffalo heifer. The four of us soon set forth with Ranga and Bara carrying my greatcoat, water bottle, sandwiches and an empty beer bottle filled with tea. There was also my torch equipment, which could be fastened to my rifle with two clamps. Lotta brought up the rear, driving the bull and the heifer. I admit I acted rather selfishly in choosing the eastern side of the hillock in preference to the western, as suggested by Lotta, as I had reasoned the tiger was more likely to approach in this direction, since it overlooked the stream. I also selected the buffalo heifer in preference to the black bull as tigers are sometimes rather shy of a fully black animal. Secondly, having refused one of the baits last night, a bull, I hoped the tiger would not refuse a young buffalo. Next came the task of finding a suitable place in which to sit, and this presented some difficulty as the jungle growth on the lower two-thirds of the hill consisted mainly of bushes, grass and trees that were neither high enough nor strong enough to bear my weight in a macan. I was soon forced to face the fact that there was no suitable spot whatever on this part of the hill, unless I was prepared to sit on the ground in a bush, which would be very hazardous. The idea then came to me to climb a little higher, among the rocks that were piled in profusion on the upper slopes. We did so, and in a little while came across a formation that seemed to suit my purpose admirably. Two boulders, each over 12 feet high, touched a third wedged in between them and a little higher than the first two being about 15 feet high. The three rocks were at an angle to one another of slightly less than 90 degrees. The space in front was open and overlooked the hillside and the Gullithahala rivulet below. If I sat at the base of the center and highest of the three rocks, after getting my retainers to cut thorns and wedge them firmly into the spaces between the bases of the three rocks, I would be quite safe against attack from the rear. To get at me, the tiger would have to jump onto one or other of the three rocks, which he could easily do, but even then I would not be directly visible to him owing to the curvature of the boulders. He would have to leap down into the amphitheater in the center first, and then turn to find and attack me, which would leave me time enough for a shot. The only other way in which he could get at me would be to come around from the exposed area in front, where I intended to tether my buffalo heifer, at a spot about 15 yards away. I reasoned that, even if the tiger discovered my presence and had brains enough to sneak around the outer edge of the rocks, he would find the heifer confronting him, which would be a definite deterrent. He might make up his mind to kill it, he might walk around to inspect it, but its presence would definitely confuse him and confuse his original plan of attack. Lastly, the buffalo would be visible to the tiger from the top of the hill and would serve to attract him. Of course, if he tried to creep through one or other of the spaces between the rocks, he would need to clear away the thorns and the noise would afford me ample warning. I was therefore very pleased at my good fortune in finding such an excellent and comparatively safe hiding place. I explained my plan to my three companions, who unanimously agreed that it was a really good one. While I sat at the entrance keeping guard over them with my rifle, they scurried a short way down the hill and came back carrying quantities of cut thorns, which they proceeded to wedge tightly into gaps at the base of the boulders. Finally they tethered the heifer by its forefoot to a stake they hammered into the earth at a spot exactly 20 paces from where I was going to sit. It now remained to find a suitable place on the other side of the hill for Lotta to hide in with his uncle's ancient matchlock. I wanted to help in this and so, rather than walk directly across the hill from where we stood, or climb over its crest as a shortcut, when in either case the tiger might see or hear us and take alarm, we descended to the base of the hill in single file and made a detour, walking along the stream for a short distance and then through the intervening jungle, led by Lotta before climbing the hillock again on the opposite face. The conditions here were exactly the same as on the eastern side. 
There was no tree big enough for a Macan on the lower slopes and so we climbed higher, into the zone of the rocks and boulders. It was too much to expect to find such an ideal hide, as the one I had secured, and after clambering over and stumbling in between the heaped rocks, Lotta finally selected an almost flat slab of rock that was slightly higher on the end that raced the summit or the hillock. He said that this was all to the good, and that he would lie prone on top of the rock and tie the black bull in front of the higher end, from where it would be an uninterrupted view of the tiger, whose cave was around the corner or shoulder of the hill, out of sight of the flat rock and considerably higher up. It was now about 4 p.m. and too late for us to go back to camp. The upper surface of the flat rock, being to the west of the hillock and directly exposed to the rays of the afternoon sun had become far too hot for Lotta to take up his position immediately. So we all helped in tethering the black bull, and then left Lotta with his matchlock sheltering in the shade on the lee side of his rock. He said he would climb up at about 5.30, as soon as the rock had cooled. Once more Ranga, Byra and I slithered down the hill, detoured through the jungle and down the bed of the stream, and came to the place where I would have to start climbing to regain the three rocks where I was going to sit. Here I parted company with my two servants, after giving them strict instructions that they should return to the hamlet and remain there till morning, when I would come back to them. It was a few minutes after five when I got back to my hiding place. The heifer, quite undisturbed, was resting on the ground, half asleep. The sun had already sunk below the crest of the hillock to the west, so that it was comparatively cool at the foot of the rocks and entirely in the shade, particularly as I was sitting to the east of them and had the rocks between me and the ridge of the hill over which, as I have just said, the sun had already set. There being no jungle in the immediate vicinity, Hardly any sounds reached me other than the distant twittering of the hundreds of bulbuls that fed on the clusters of blue-black lantana berries at the foot of the hill. Lower yet was the belt of greenery which denoted the tamarind, muddy and jumlum trees bordering the stream. From that direction I heard the occasional cries of jungle fowl and spurfowl as the cockbirds sent out their evening challenges to their rivals before settling down for the night. It grew quite dark soon after six o'clock, Although I could still see the trees that grew along both banks of the stream far below me, the scrub jungle in the middle distance, and the heifer only twenty yards away. I remember comparing the scene to a picture on a cinema screen, where the spectator in the audience sits in darkness while the screen is illuminated. But very soon that picture faded, too, and then all around me was a dense, heavy blackness, relieved only by the few stars that twinkled directly overhead. The rocks around me seemed to shut me in from the usual and pleasant sounds of the jungle. Then, just as my watch showed ten minutes past eight, the silence was rudely shattered by a sudden, distant, wailing scream, followed in a second or two by the deep boom of a muzzle-loading gun. Then there was complete silence till, in another half-minute, a distant sambardo, somewhere in the valley below, as startled by the sounds as I had been, began to utter her resonant cry of alarm, that echoed and re-echoed down and across the dells and the jungle-clad aisles of the forest, to fade into nothingness in the mountain fastnesses. I sprang to my feet. Without doubt something terrible had happened to poor Lotta. The weird cry I had heard, although it had sounded inhuman, could only have come from his lips. The report of a muzzle loader, quite distinct to experienced ears from that of a rifle or breech loading gun, could only have emanated from the ancient musket he was carrying. The fact that the scream had come first indicated that Lotta had either been attacked or severely frightened and then had fired in self-defense. But Lotta was not the sort of man to be easily frightened. It was doubtful whether Ranga and Byra, back at the hamlet over a mile away, would have heard the musket shot, particularly as it came from the other side of the hill. They would certainly not have heard the scream, and I had emphatically instructed them not to leave the village. So there was but one thing to do, and at once. I would have to go to Lotta myself, and see what aid I could give him. With the help of the torch that was clamped to my rifle I stumbled downhill through the scrub jungle to the bed of the stream, up which I ran for a short distance. 
I did not know the shortcut leading across the belt of jungle to the spot at the foot of the hillock from where we had started climbing to reach the flat rock, for it was the Sholiga himself who had led us along that path. So I followed the only alternative, which was to cut across from the stream to the foot of the hillock towards the west, and start climbing in a half-left direction that would, sooner or later, bring me within hearing distance of the injured man, who would answer me if he was still alive. I felt myself trembling with excitement and nervousness as I forced myself to climb upwards through the scrub belt, flashing the beam of the torch from side to side in fear that the man-eater might ambush me at any moment. Finally the scrub petered out and those awful rocks began. I could see the top of the hillock outlined against the starry sky and, keeping this to my half right, I pressed forward as best I could in that difficult terrain. In a few moments, Judging that I was within earshot of Lotta, I began to call his name as loudly as I could, conscious as I did so that I might succeed in accomplishing one of two things, either in driving the man-eater away or in attracting him to me. For quite a long while there was no answer to my calls. Then I heard a feeble groan. I stopped walking to catch the direction from which the sound had come, and shouted again, Lotta, where are you? Answer me, and I will come to you. I heard a subdued moan, followed in a few seconds by a faint cry, Darai, I am here. I can see your light. You are going too high up the hill. Walk forward, but come a little lower. The voice had seemed to come from very far away, but I stumbled on Lotta within a hundred yards. He had fallen to the base of the rock on which he had been lying, but had managed to cling to his matchlock, although he could not reload it. The Shaliga had been badly clawed down his back, buttocks and thighs. Very fortunately he had not been bitten. In a whisper he told me that the tiger had evidently seen him from somewhere on top of the hill and had worked around to the rear, while he had been lying on the sloping rock facing uphill, where we had tied the black bull. Without warning it had sprung onto the rock from behind and then had jumped onto his back and begun to claw him. Unable to turn around or point his weapon, he had just pressed his finger on the trigger. The roar of the explosion, and no doubt the flame and smoke from the black powder, had evidently frightened the beast, for it had sprung away, knocking him off the rock in doing so. Lotta had been lying at the foot of the boulder, expecting the man-eater to return at any moment, when he had seen the light from my torch and heard me calling his name. Had he fallen to the left of the rock instead of to its right, it would have come between him and me, and he would never have been able to see my light. A closer examination by torchlight revealed that, although severely and deeply clawed, and bleeding profusely, no very serious or dangerous wound had been inflicted. The man was obviously suffering from severe shock and was in great pain, but there was no trace of a bite. I pointed out to him that we would have to get back to the hamlet somehow, as no help would reach us till morning. At first Lotta said he could not stand, but as the effects of shock wore off I drew him to his feet. After abandoning his matchlock, which he was loath at first to do, he clung to my neck with both hands. I supported him with my left arm while I held my rifle, with the torch still alight, in my right hand. In this manner we began a nightmare journey down the hill. With difficulty, and only after a long time, we reached the streams, where Lotta collapsed with exhaustion. From there I carried him on my shoulders, fireman's lift fashion, and by the time we got back to the hamlet I was dead beat, while the cells of my torch, that had been burning for so long, had grown very dim. We awoke the inhabitants and all became a bustle of excitement as hot water was prepared. I then washed the shalaga's wounds as best I could and poured onto them raw crystals of potassium permanganate, followed by iodine. It was crude treatment, I knew, and he groaned with pain. Finally, I injected the contents of two files of penicillin procaine, which totaled eight lakh units, into his buttocks. Dad and I always make a point of carrying a hypodermic syringe, penicillin, iodine, a sharp knife, bandages, cotton wool and other items of first aid on our shikar trips, to meet such emergencies. It was past 3 a.m. when I told the headman of the hamlet that he would have to press eight able-bodied men into service early next morning to carry Lotta on a charpoy to the Calvary River and, after crossing by ferry, on the Utimali.
from where I would take him in my car to the hospital at Pentagram. I was falling asleep from sheer exhaustion when Byra came to me with a dramatic idea. Durai, he said, let us make a last attempt to kill this tiger. After being frightened by the explosion from the muzzle loader it has probably gone back to its cave and is hiding there. You go to sleep now. I will call you when the jungle cocks begin to crow. We will go back to the stream and climb the hill as day breaks. You creep along the top till you reach the point at which the langur sprang back, overlooking the entrance to the cave. After allowing you sufficient time to get into position, I will come along the hill from one side and momentarily show myself before the cave. The tiger, provided it is inside, will probably growl first before he attacks, which he will then do by charging out. I will step back and hide flat against the rock so as not to get in the way. You shoot him through the back from above, with both barrels of your rifle. I have spoken. Nonsense, I began remonstrating, when Byra broke in. Go to sleep now quickly, Durai. You have hardly two hours in which to take some rest. And I was so tired that I fell asleep before I could argue. Promptly at five Byra awoke me, and true to his promise I could hear the jungle cocks crowing, although it was quite dark outside. Still undecided as to whether I was being wise or foolish, I followed him. The torch gave out long before we reached the bed of the stream. Believe it or not, although I had been most careful to check all the equipment I had brought with me from Bangalore, this most important item, extra torch batteries, had been overlooked. But I had the utmost confidence in my old jungle friend, Ira, and so I kept behind him as we groped through the heavy belt of trees and eventually found ourselves on the dry sands of the stream. Here we sat for another half an hour, till dawn began to break. Then I removed the torch and the clamps from the barrel of my rifle, as these would now be a needless impediment, rechecked the rounds in the two barrels of my .470, and began to follow Byra up the hill. When we had almost reached the top, he took me by the arm and whispered, You go on from here, Durai. Make no sound whatever. Creep along till you reach the summit. Then turn to your left and continue until you are directly above the cave. Lie down there and be ready with your finger on the trigger. I will give you plenty of time before I show myself. When you shoot, fire both barrels to make sure. Then, without another word he disappeared behind a boulder. With many misgivings I did as the little old man had told me. To reach the top of the hill and work my way along the ridge to the left was easy enough. But to recollect the very spot to which I had followed the Langua monkey was a very different matter. Thrice I misjudged the place and, looking down from above, saw no cave. Then I remembered the rather tapering boulder that served to hide the cave entrance from sight when standing on the stream. At last I spotted it, and keeping it in view as a marker, soon recognized the exact place from which I had overlooked the mouth of the cave after the Langua monkey had rushed back. Once more the cave was directly below me. Now another thought began to worry me. Had Byra given me enough time to allow for the three mistakes I had made in finding the place? I had heard no sound, so nothing could have happened. Silently I lay down on the bare rock above, so that the muzzle of my rifle overhung the narrow entrance to the cave. And there I waited and waited. But still Byra did not appear. Then abruptly, before ever I was aware of his proximity, the little man came into view from below and to the left of me. Calmly but gingerly, so as to make no sound before the right moment had come, he walked towards the narrow cave mouth, stood before it, kicked a loose stone with his foot, and cleared his throat. Like lightning, after that, he nipped back the way he had come and disappeared from my view behind a ledge to the left. Events followed quickly. The ground on which I lay seemed to rumble as if with an approaching earthquake as the tiger growled within the cave below me. Then he roared loudly, and the next second had dashed into view from out of the very bowels of the earth. As the man-eater hesitated for a moment, not knowing where the man who had so impertinently disturbed his privacy had gone, my first shot took him behind the neck. He somersaulted and fell on his back, the white of his belly turned towards me, all four legs threshing the air wildly. My second shot went through his chest. 
He had hardly stopped twitching when Byra reappeared around the corner, and with hands on hips smiled up at me broadly, the smile of one whose plan of campaign has worked out to perfection. In great excitement, I slid down the rock from above, arriving in a most undignified manner, all of a heap, at Byra's feet and uncomfortably close to the tiger which we were both not quite certain was really dead. There we waited for about five minutes. Then Byra threw a stone that glanced off the animal without bringing any response. That told us what we wanted to know, the tiger was dead. And now the moment for unlocking the secret which had puzzled Dad and me and a host of others for practically five years. Why had this tiger formed the habit of scratching and clawing, rather than biting, its human victims when it first attacked them? The mystery was solved at last when we examined the dead animal. The whole of its nose had been blown away by an old gunshot wound, probably caused by a .12 shotgun or perhaps a muzzle loader, which had also shattered the bone at the bridge, extending from the nostrils to between the eyes. What must have been a ghastly and extremely painful injury had healed marvelously, but the tiger had doubtless never forgotten to associate the terrible wound with the human race, and so had taken great care to keep the organ out of the way and safe from possible harm every time he attacked a man. This could be the only explanation, as such cattle as had been killed by this tiger had been done to death in the normal manner, with teeth as well as his claws. Besides, he had eaten normally. The wound, as I could see, had healed perfectly. Therefore it was very unlikely that he still suffered pain in the act of biting. Assuredly, but for this injury, he would have remained like any normal tiger, quite harmless to the human race. In great exultation we hurried back to the hamlet and told the good news. Lotta was loud in his congratulations. Every man, woman and child of Bejahai turned out and climbed the hill to see the dead man eater for themselves. It was a joyful procession that walked back to Utaimalai a little later, with Lotta on a charpoy carried by eight men, and the skin of the tiger, rolled in a bundle, on Byra's head. Although the jolting must have caused the Sholiga considerable pain, he never complained or murmured once, but was garrulous in his praise of me as the slayer of the tiger, and of the little old Pujari, Byra, whose jungle cunning had brought about its end and whose fearlessness had flushed the man-eater from its den. I felt guilty for having delayed the medical attention that would otherwise have been rendered Lotta earlier by my action in going back for the tiger. But I am glad to say he made a quick and easy recovery. Nothing Byra did could have raised him higher in my estimation. My admiration for him was at its peak. Old Ranga was a bit crestfallen that his competitor had managed to steal a march over him on this occasion. But the two of them, joined now by Lotta, are always awaiting us as faithful friends, companions and assistants, ready to serve Dad and myself at any time. The End